right. All right, here we go. Uh, round number two of the Coach's Corner from Central London Weightlifting Club. Alex? Well, nice. I've got, some, I've got quite a few questions here. Um, I don't know how many we'll get through, but again, just <laughs> don't really. <laughs> I mean, we had five last time and it ended up being like, Almost an hour, was it? <laughs> well, to be fair, we did, we did keep diverging. Yeah, 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 I'm gonna try and stay on topic. That's my goal for, for this um, this chat. I'm gonna be as obtuse as I can. Um, so the first one comes from my my boss, from Connor, um, which is, <laughs> how are you adapting your training? Uh, what does training when lockdown is over look like? So. This is Go weird. I'm going to get you to answer your own question. Oh, you want me to answer my own yeah, question? <laughs> I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've been doing is like very mixed bag. So to try and keep that expression of power and speed, um, I've been doing, like I just mentioned, some sprints twice a week um, and also some plyometrics. So like jumps. Um and then more for, I guess, general conditioning or at least muscular endurance. I've been doing uh, timed sets. So, for example, I'll set a timer for anywhere between 50 and 20 minutes and I'll pick two or three exercises and I'll just do five or 10 reps of each and just try and do as many as I can, basically, mm -hmm. without failing. And if I feel like failing, for example, I'll start on 10 and then I'll take it down to nine and then eight and then seven and then six. So I'm trying to get complete sets rather than like, you know, keep failing and doing like one, 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 one. Yeah. Um, but then I'm also conscious that with weightlifting, uh, obviously I'm doing the speed and the um, plyo work. There's n very limited amount of strength that I've been doing. Like muscular endurance is great, but it's difficult to then translate that back into when we're actually going into the gym. So I've also been doing some uh, yielding isometrics and some overcoming isos. So essentially like grabbing a towel and just doing a movement like a push up or uh, a rack pull, but just like pulling against the towel instead, just mm. to kind of simulate that max force production against the towel. Um, and it's not ideal, but the thing is, is that like you, we never were able to predict this situation. So I'm kind of just making it like making the best of a, of a bad situation. I've also done a little bit of CrossFit. I'm not going to lie. I've got a little bit of sweat on. feels pretty good. Um, and obviously, you know, taking the time as well to just rest my shoulders, rest my elbow, rest my knee, and doing a little bit of rehab around there as well is a perfect time to, to get all this stuff in so that when you return back to training, hopefully mm -hmm. all of those niggles that you had uh, are no longer there because you've actually taken the time to focus on areas that usually tend to get overworked because other areas aren't as strong yeah yeah no. um anyway that's all i'm gonna say on that i'm gonna take it over to you and see what you've been doing i mean we all know what you've been doing let's be honest <laughs> be maxing out bro yeah <laughs> i haven't changed anything i bought a laco and i've started <laughs> waiting <laughs> and a place and that is all i need <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think from what i've seen from like other people and to uh, jump off your point about kind of working on weaknesses and stuff is that like because we've had access to less equipment and you know to kind of this different spaces people have been forced to sort of improvise and yeah. to do things and to kind of swap training around a little bit so yeah. you know again like people have been trying stuff that they've never done before before like floor presses we know yeah, yeah. Floor presses just did some this afternoon i've never done those before but they're quite fun yeah but it's, um, it's just like lots of different ways of just you know again working on your sort of like weak areas and like if anything i think the variety is quite it's quite good it's kind yeah of good. i agree I've, I've learned a lot from it just being forced to okay you've got Adapt. a bar and bumpers and that's it what can you do with that um so yeah no i think it's, it's i think it's been decent i think like a lot of people as well you know having been like you know either their hours have been cut or they've been furloughed or you know studies of gone virtual that kind of thing um they've suddenly got a lot more time um yeah. so you know you're, you're seeing like a lot of people um put you know just what else if you're in the house all day <laughs> what else are you gonna do you know yeah. you can head out to the park you know get some exercise in the park do some work at home that kind of thing so i think like yeah from what i've seen it took a little while for people to get adjusted mm. um but 
yeah, it's it's been kind of quite interesting. But yeah, no, I've, yeah. I've just been I've, I've, my my training. I've tried to keep it. It's very similar to kind of what I was doing, but I'm obviously limited by you know just kind of the range of the equipment um, and that sort of thing. But I've been trying out new exercises that I haven't done before. Um, just doing a load of squats because that seems to be the best bang for the buck at the moment. Yep. Um, I think that's, yeah, kind of same old, same old, really. Just yeah. can't do jerks for fear of destroying the deck. But there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just in case you miss it. Yeah. Um, so then I guess going on to the second part of that question. Now, obviously, I was the one that asked this question. So I'm going to take it over to you and see what you think yeah. would be wise for people to do uh when it comes back into their training so i guess reintegrating people back into uh properly weightlifting rather than just doing some training mm. um so once lockdown's eased getting back into it what would i do i mean you yeah. know what i do but i wouldn't recommend anybody else do that um i think slowly ramp it up um yeah you know, get more familiar with the lifts, just like, don't, you know, come back expecting to, you know, be hitting like hundred percent easily and still have the same movement patterns. Like I yeah. took seven, I think it was about seven weeks off and I lost about 20% of my strength. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, you know, a big shock. And I know a lot of people that was like, luckily I have a, you know, a bar and bumpers, but a lot of people have gone for a longer time without access to equipment. And so that, knock is going to be a lot harder yeah um, but again like you know the strength will recover um but if you give yourself too much too early you're putting yourself at really high risk of injury you're going to get yourself down as well because mm -hmm. you're you say oh i've hit this this was a warm-up weight for me why am i struggling with it now yeah so i think like coming into it and take it easy do a lot of technique work dial in the patterns again yeah. um you know, don't worry about almost like kind of forget all your previous numbers completely, mm -hmm. completely new blank slate. Okay. So start to work up, you know, start testing occasionally, like, you know, what maybe, am I working with? Yeah. 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 So like, you know, keep sort of testing like every yeah. so often, but not, you know, you don't want like RP 10 or like 90% plus. No, 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 no. I mean, it, I've, I've been given this a lot of thought and I think actually you summed it up well, where you were saying that, I think it give it almost forces you the opportunity to focus on uh, slightly a slightly different aspect that people might not have wanted to previously. Where obviously your strength might have declined ever so slightly. Um, it's difficult to measure that because obviously strength is can vary day to day, week to week, month to month. Like. You know, even if you're training, you might lose, like you just said, 20% of strength from one day to the next. Yeah. But obviously you are in a, in a, uh, you are in a specific detrained effect to weightlifting. Mm. You might have been training, but it's not weightlifting. Oh. So what all you're looking to do is just reintroduce that novelty that you haven't done over a period of say anywhere between two and four weeks. Yeah. And I think, um, obviously it's going to be quicker for some people it's going to be slower for some people but that's where that's mm. where kind of um you know knowing your body and knowing what is right and what isn't right and exactly like you said i for one probably wouldn't take anything above an rpe8 for at least two or three weeks yeah I'm I'm completely um agree. And, and I, honestly, I think I would stretch that out for at least four weeks, to be honest, because like you're going to be so detrained that everything is going to be, I mean, obviously I'm speaking hypothetically if you haven't been training, but even if you have, you know, it's going to take quite a while for you to get used to the, the delayed onset muscle soreness that you're going to have. Yeah, that you know, first week everything's going to feel so <laughs> weird. Like your brain is going to be like, what the hell is a snatch? Yeah. Um, you know, so it's a perfect time, like you said, to dial in the movement patterns, to focus on technique, to focus on any kind of area that you feel weak in. Like if it's your overhead position, then maybe just work that into the sessions that you have, because now you're, I guess, more inclined because you have the time to focus on that rather than continuing to push the stuff that you enjoy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you know? true. 
like hangs for example of stuff in the blocks like yeah. um, <laughs> but um yeah no i think like for myself it's i'm coming towards the end of my fourth week and now my numbers are getting you know between like 90 95 percent of what i was previously doing um but obviously i've had you know i've been like training quite frequently and quite often yeah so i would i think for most people you should probably expect between like you know four to eight weeks one to two months before you're back to a hundred percent yeah um like yeah um yeah i think uh, the thing is as well on that is sorry just to interrupt but like to not put pressure on yourself because like if you say to yourself i'm gonna snatch my max number in two months yeah, it's a yeah. good driver but at the same time you've got to be careful how much like stress that's going to put you under if yeah. you're pushing yourself from a detrained t a detrained state mm. to the maximum state of fitness that you were in to hit that number in two months yeah so like yeah. you just said like kind of wipe the state clean and just say you know every day take it as it comes um you know if something doesn't feel good maybe don't push it as much Mm. Um, if something feels good, maybe just take it up a little bit more. But what we're not saying is in the first four weeks, I wouldn't expect anyone to go anywhere near to a maximum amount of weight. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe you could work up to like a squat or a pull or something that's a little bit less technical yeah. in four to six weeks, but for weightlifting specific movements, snatch, clean and jerk, I think it's going to take a little bit more time to just reintegrate yourself to get used to the amount of stress that your body has to handle whilst performing those movements yeah 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 but, you know, I'd, I'd say yeah just come into it again just try and forget your previous numbers and um, just look look forward to each training session you know if like because you will see that climb from week to week is almost quite drastic it's almost like beginner gains all over yeah. again New beginning. And, um, <laughs> so i'd say you know just just like don't think about everything before lockdown just think about what you did last week and yeah. you know, just try and like have a better session or have a better week yeah. and um, and then just use that and build from that yeah cool but yeah all right uh let's go through the list mm. got one from keely uh-huh uh, in a similar vein um yeah. how to move past a plateau I mean, that's, that's quite a big question in itself. Um, I think to keep it simple, because obviously there's a lot of things that you could discuss as to why you're plateauing, mm. whether that be technical, whether it be strength based, whether it be like mental, that you have a mental block when you get to a heavy weight and you think, oh, I can't do this. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, generally plateaus will occur when there's a deficit in either strength or technique, or like I said, um, if, if it's your mental aspect that needs work on. Uh, and I think it's identifying what you need to work on the most to reap the most amount of reward from that. Yeah. If we're talking a specific number, for example, you've been stuck at a 70 kilo squat for three months. Well, just because you've been stuck at a 70 kilo squat for three months, you have to kind of take a step back and assess, well, yes, I might have only squatted 70 kilos, but there might be a few other factors. How many times have you hit 85% plus in the last month? That will also accrue to, you know, the intensity that you're trying to drive. How much volume are you doing in one session within a given percentage? Again, is another marker of how much volume you can accumulate, i.e. how much stress your body can handle in training. But I think the other thing as well is subjective. How fast is it moving? How nice does it feel? How smooth does it feel? Uh, obviously, no one can tell you that. You are the only person who can feel that. So I think there's a lot of different parts that play into a plateau. Um, and I think for me, that's one of the reasons why you do periodized programs where you don't just chuck, uh, you know, four random weeks at someone and you know expect them to get better it's progressive whether that be linear whether it be undulated where you balance um volume and intensity it either week or either day or whatever it is 
uh, whether you use either day to focus on strength, hypertrophy, power, whatever that might be. Um, but then again, like, like I said, um, it's not, it's not necessarily a plateau is not necessarily an indicator that you have stalled your progress. It's just like, there's a lot of other factors that play into a, a plateau. If you're a gym bro and you've been benching a hundred kilos for four years and you've only been doing five sets of five, well, then that's the problem, isn't it? Because you've been doing the same set and rep range. You haven't done any other stimulus. You also might not have developed, um, you know, you might need to do a bit more hypertrophy in that area, or you might need to work on the opposing muscle to, to break that plateau. If you're not doing any pulling movements, but all you're doing is pressing movements, well then maybe that's a weak link. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I think that's kind of summed up my answer. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty, yeah. uh, yeah, <laughs> I told you I was going to be succinct today. <laughs> I think like, yeah, well, plateau, the thing is, it's just like, one person's plateau is not another one, another person's plateau. Everybody plateaus for different reasons. Like yeah. it can be mental, it can be like physical, um, you know, it can be down to your recovery, what, whatever it is. So it's very much like an individual case. I think yeah. you've got to assess your training and you've got to look at, okay, right. What's the program I'm following? How am I executing that program? And am, am I doing it well? Am I coming in, you know, in a good headspace? Am I actually attacking these weights? Um, Am I eating well? Am I sleeping well? Mm -hmm. Like what's going on in the rest of my life? Like, am I stressed out all the time and not recovering properly? Like, I think it's, yeah, it's difficult to say like generally. Yeah. Um, but again, like doing that kind of assessment and just trying to figure out, okay, what could be causing this? What's the most likely, you know, kind of reason? Like, you know, if I keep missing lifts because I've got a dodgy right elbow, it's probably because of the dodgy right elbow. So, you know, maybe I need to do more pressing movements. Maybe I need to do more bench press like anything to strengthen that it's yeah. not going to be an issue with the first ball it's not going to be an issue with the second so it's like it's doing that kind of assessment and yeah just trying to figure out like what areas are weak what areas could be contributing to this problem what areas can i improve yeah precisely um, i think that's that's all i could add to i think you also touched on that as well where you said recovery because i think sometimes when it comes to plateaus people think they need to continue to do more but honestly, sometimes it might just be a case of you actually doing less yeah. so you can recover. Also just variation. Like, yeah. um, well, I mean, mm. yeah, the, the, I mean, exactly like you, you said, I think the two ways to be able to create that novelty will be progression through percentages or volume or variation where you add novelty. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the main reasons why, um, you know, we, we have different, and I think like blessed, I feel blessed that we're in a sport in weightlifting where uh, we have so many different variations of a lift and it's not necessarily just to uh, have. So, cause for example, it, when I first started weightlifting for a whole year, all I did was snatch and clean jerk. That was my session four mm -hmm. days a week, snatch and clean jerk. And it was boring as hell. <laughs> I hated it. Though, and not. the thing is I got better, but, there came a point where it like it wasn't making me any better because all I was doing was snatch and clean and jerk. Like it's very specific to the demand that I'm trying to impose. But after that, uh, there's areas that are that that will be weaker. Your pull or your squat or your recovery or it's in your head where you need to just you know focus on a different area. If you can clean it but you can't jerk it, why the hell are you keep doing cleans? Like work on your jerk or something like that. Um, and I think it's definitely, like you said, a case, it, it's a case by case, um, you know, thing. And, and that's something that you can work on with your coach or, you know, sometimes as well, people neglect it. They just go, uh, they know the reason they plateau because they're doing X, Y, and Z, but they just don't want to do the thing that's going to make them better because either it hurts, i.e., you know, it's painful because you have to do more squats or they just can't be asked. Yeah. yeah no I, th I think like th this is something that is like you, ca you can see in people but they don't it's like they don't want to admit it to themselves it's like I know you're intelligent enough to know why you're not improving so just get get over it, yeah. <laughs> just admit it. you know admit that you know you need to actually do your accessories admit that you need to turn up on time admit you know whatever it is yeah and, um 
I think like that, but that can be really tough. And I think that's definitely a, a skill that takes a little bit of time to learn. So like, you know, if you can, you know, first thing, if you can be honest with yourself <laughs> and then you know, again, just try and get rid of the emotions, try and get rid of any guilt or shame or any nonsense that's attached to it right. and just say, you know, right. I'm not improving in this area. This is the reason for it. Yeah. Now, do I want to do anything about it? Because, you know, maybe you're quite happy, you know, you're stuck at 100 kilos, but eh, you're actually kind of happy with the work that you're doing and you're yeah, yeah. happy with your numbers. Like, yeah. you know, maybe you, you're happy on that plateau. Like, yeah. some people are, but they still say, oh, yeah, I want to improve my squat. We'll just, like, we'll just pick one. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like troubleshooting with a computer, isn't it? Like, your computer yeah. crashes. The first thing you do is turn it off, turn it back on again. The simplest thing. <laughs> Next thing is it turns on, you give it a whack, it turns on, but then it shuts off again. And then after that, you have to find out a little bit more complex way to do it. And then eventually you ring someone who knows what they're doing and they go, oh, it's just this. And you go, oh, fucking hell. Well, that was all right then, wasn't it? It's, ba it's exactly the same thing. No, it's, it's true. It's like, you know, you, you do like, you work from the easiest fix and then you start exploring the yeah. kind of, you know, the more obtuse and you know, strange avenues that might produce a fix, but also might not. Yeah. So. so if, for example, going back to that example of having the, uh, the bodybuilder, he's doing five sets of five, maybe he needs to do five sets of six or six sets of five, but only once a week. And if that doesn't change, then maybe change a different variable. Yeah. You know, maybe drop the reps. And so you can do a little bit more weight and then add another session where, uh, you know, you're focusing on a bit more volume or just, have a little bit more frequency where rather than doing one massive session, you split it two or three times over the week. So that you, you are actually being able to do more volume over those three sessions rather than just cramming it all into one session. Yeah. Anyway, think, yeah. <laughs> right. hopefully that, I think, yeah, I think that answered the question to be fair. <laughs> I mean, we won't know because Keely's not on this, on this no, call. This it's 4am her time. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Not <laughs> um, so we've got another question from Beth. Did you uh -huh. want to ask a question, Beth? Um, yes. Yeah, so I wanted just to know about um, like how you can remove or reduce calluses on your hands um, or just if you've got them, kind of how to maintain them or get rid of them. Yeah. Cool. So it's so dependent on the person, isn't it? And like, because my hands are fine. But yeah. I know your hands are a lot, <laughs> like you struggle a little bit more than me. Yeah, I've I've got really small hands, so when it comes to like barbell work, I generally tend to. I wouldn't say that I've got soft hands, but I think because my hands are small, they generally tend to um, get beaten up a little bit more than someone who's got like big hands that can just wrap it around the. You're also lifting like a lot more than most people. Well, so I know, but that's that's the difference is because it's obviously comparative, because yeah. it's not like I'm just going to go from eighty kilos to like two hundred. Like it's now, obviously I've had the time to build up that resilience to the weight. Um, I think it's, 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 it is an interesting question, you know, because I don't actually think I've really thought about trying to make my hands, I guess, calloused. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of just happens over time to the point where because you are handling a barbell four or five times a week, you're, it's basically your body's way of adapting to you know the the stress that you're giving your hands mm. it's not to say that i like some sessions i'll use straps just because sometimes grip is a limiting factor and i'm not saying to use straps all the time because otherwise you're not going to develop any grip strength but i think really by like doing the actual thing that it is that you're trying to focus on mm. um i think that's what's going to help the most yeah uh and I mean, obviously, we're not really talking about grip here. We're more just talking about calloused hands. Mm. Um, but for me, I think it just happens over time. I'm not really sure. To... I mean, you could try and rub your hands over a cheese grater or something, but I don't, <laughs> I don't, I, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. Like that, <laughs> that would hurt and it probably wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. It would slice your hands up loads. You'd have some very um, dodgy pasta at any rate. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if, uh, like, keeping your hands dry, keeping your hands chalked. Yeah, this is um, one thing um, that I really notice with because the weather's been a bit like sometimes it's been really hot and humid, sometimes it's been a little bit cooler. 
And on those days where it's really warm and humid, my hands get beat up so much more than, you know, on the kind of cooler days. And I'm sure it's to do with, they just sweat a lot more. Yeah. Um, so just making sure that like you're using chalk and um, yeah. using it like if, if your hands are giving you trouble, just get as much chalk on there as you can. You can use yeah. straps as well, like for accessories and things. Like if you're doing, you know, like pools, that kind of thing, like using straps is, you know, base it, it will help your hands. It will also mean yeah. that, you know, grip is not a limiting factor because in a pool, it's like you, you're more training, like your kind of back and legs than you are your grip. So you should yeah. arguably be using straps um, yeah. anyway. But um, I think like I found just um, using like a, like like a pumice pumice stone yeah i use that on my on my hands before as well actually it works well yeah for, for like the really Honest. really kind of bad ones if you've got um like cuticle nippers as well you can always use those to take i'm not sure what that is alex <laughs> they're just like you know little ones for taking your you know do, doing get you, getting your nails did not that i ever do my nails because they what don't. like like when you cut your nails no the um they're, they're a little different. I don't, I don't know if I have any around here. The, the girls will know what I mean. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to Google it right now because I'm interested to know what a cuticle... What's it called? A cuticle cutter? Yeah, cuticle nipper or cuticle cutter. They're really, really good. Okay. Is, that not, is that not just um, nail clippers? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. You don't want to be cutting your nails with one of those. <laughs> I don't know. All right. But yeah, they're, they're yeah, yeah. And, um, um, but yeah, I think like I never really had to use like softening creams or anything like that. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe try them, but I can't. I can see them making the situation worse. I um, can't necessarily mm. see them making it better, unless like you've got really cracked and yeah, yeah. hands, and in which case that like you know they need it because they're too dry or you know that kind of thing but like yeah just just keep your hands dry and um that will tend to yeah make, make the problem okay yeah see so because because I, I obviously from like the skin condition that i've got i have to use uh like cream on my hands and stuff because otherwise if they get too dry like you said they crack so one of the things that i use is a thing called o'keefe's working hands and they've got a couple of different varieties. I think now you can buy them in supermarkets and stuff, but it's basically just like a really thick balm that you rub on your hands and it basically mm. helps uh, like the, the hands, I guess, soak up because it's hard skin, like yeah. really hard skin on your hands. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd say keep your hands dry. Um, I wouldn't condition them because like if they're soft, it's, that's not going to help. Mm. But if they are dry and they're getting cracked, then you need to obviously uh, look after the cracks. So I'd say try and avoid moisturizer. Go a little bit more towards like the balms. So like maybe the Vaseline or like that O'Keefe's working hands that I used. Keep your hands dry. And also if you are starting to get calluses, I sometimes cut mine off with a razor blade. Um, if they get really bad and like really painful, um especially if like because uh, obviously the more time you like you lift the kind of calluses get a little bit flexible but after you first get a callus it can sometimes be really hard and like s not scratchy but like it hurts do you know when it like digs into your palm yeah, yeah so uh sometimes i cut those big ones off with a like a scalpel or um like a razor blade just mm. obviously be careful because i don't want you to like slice yeah, your hand don't, open don't slice <laughs> But yeah, hopefully that kind of answered the question. Um, yeah, no, it's a good question though, because because you don't really. It's not really something that I give that I've given too much thought about. You know, when obviously when people come up and they're like, "Oh, my hands are hurting," mm. you just go, "Yeah, that just like that is weightlifting." <laughs> you just over. like you know. <laughs> but obviously, it's it's definitely it's definitely something that everyone suffers with at one point in weightlifting because inherently you are going to, you're handling a barbell yeah. <laughs> three to five times a week and you're using your hands. So I think as well, what, what's, been, um, what's a really useful thing that I keep in just my, in my weightlifting bag is um, kinesiology tape or just K tape. And uh, cause you know, sometimes you get like callus tears or, you know, you get some kind of nick or scratch or something. And um 
just being able to, you know, you can wrap that around your fingers or your hands, that kind of thing. And it will at least allow you to like continue the session. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you know, you, you've had like a blister or something which is developed. You don't really want that directly on a bar. That will, that's really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just having some K tape is, and you know, sometimes, you know, as well, when one's getting really raw and, um, just putting that on top will, you know, stop it from getting, uh, any worse. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's useful, but, um, yeah, I think that's, that's cool. it on hand care. <laughs> oh yeah. We've got, um, we've got another question from Mark this time. Do you want to read your course. question? Now? Hello. Hi guys. Um, What's up? so yeah, I just, wanted you to basically describe your coaching style that sort of question for both of you individually <laughs> might be nice. for a while <laughs> yeah yeah alex you want to start i don't know i'm gonna, I'm gonna say like because we have quite different backgrounds and i think relative do we have different coaching styles because i know i've picked up a, i don't know i here. think i don't think we have different coaching styles we definitely have different like cues or ways that we go about doing things yeah um I think the goal is obviously the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for me, it's more a case of whole model parts, whole model, whereby I'll show them a lift and then I'll do a part of the lift and then I'll do the whole lift again. Yeah. So for example, if, if we have a beginner and they, um, they're going through a hip snatch, for example, I would show them a hip snatch the good way. I would show them a hip snatch the bad way. And then I would then show them the hip snatch a good way so that they can see what's good, what's bad, but then what's good. Yeah. And I think like over time, I used to be one of those people where I used to always shout loads of things at people like hips through elbows up, big chest, like, all those sorts of things. But like over time I've realized that actually sometimes people need to just have a drill and just figure it out themselves. Oh. Um, and for the first couple of years of coaching, I, I that's, uh, you know, I used that a lot of that stuff on you and you were actually like a perfect Guinea pig because <laughs> I figured out what worked well and what didn't and what works well for you. And I think this is one of the, like I've noticed the way that you coach is you like to, go through th things very systematically where your brain, you need to be, you need to understand why you're doing it that, that way and why it should be done in this order and, and how that's going to help you. Whereas for others, sometimes all they need is you're going to do this drill. This is why it's going to help. This is why, this is the good one. This is the bad one. This is the good one. Are we good? Here's the barbell crack on five, 10 minutes. You know, if you need me, come grab me. You know, some people need obviously a little bit more guidance. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a, an interesting one because I don't know if I have a specific type of style. I think the best coaches, and I'm definitely not saying that I'm an amazing coach, but I think the best coaches you'll see will steal loads of different things from different coaches that work really well. But mm. what you'll also notice is that they don't have one specific coaching style for their club. They'll have one model for the club, but it doesn't work for everyone. You no. know, you have a technical model in mind to, to shape what it should look like. And then you have to understand that everyone is very different, but also some people don't respond well to do X, Y, Z, do X, Y, Z. No, 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 do X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes you need to just show them and just let them do it. And yeah. then their brain can figure it out. I think that's so important. It's like weightlifting is not, you know, you have to just have a play. You just have to practice and you need to give people that opportunity to just have a bar and just mess around. And, um, because it's like, yeah, you, you can say something, but like you, they've got to experience it to actually understand it yeah. properly. And so it's, you know, obviously people get that. I think, yeah. So she said like, there's so many individual differences and I think like, really good coaches will kind of understand that individual okay what works well what doesn't what do they understand what don't they understand um how do they like to be coached like do, do they just want you know just more pull or do they want to under have to understand like why the pull is important like at, you know are they more technical or are they just you know focused on the movement yeah it's 
Mm. Yeah, I think it's as you say, it's like, you know, having that kind of technical model, because I think there's, there's always this raging debate as to like, oh, you know, which is, what's the best approach for weightlifting? Um, you know, where should the balance be at this point? You know, that sort of thing. And um, I think like, each coach will probably have their own opinion on that, like yeah. what arguably best or what model they should follow. Um, and then, you know, it's a case of kind of teaching people that model, but also allowing, you know, if, if some people just move in a slightly different way naturally, or just have like, you know, strange things that work for them, just kind yeah. of like, um, you know, leveraging that and just understanding that, you know, Hey, that's, you know, that's just how they do it. That's Definitely. how they do it best. But I don't know for myself, I think like, I've always been, I, I like the technical aspects of lifting a lot. And I think yeah. it's really important. Like if you want to be a good lifter, it's not just important lifting, but you should understand why you're doing a certain thing. Yeah. It just allows you to kind of connect different concepts and, you know, to really kind of get the most out of the movement and therefore to lift the most weight. Um, so, but obviously like people kind of catch that at different rates. Yeah. De I definitely take, um, I like, it's, just, it's just a bit of a shotgun approach it's um but you know it's as you say like you know here is what a full snatch is like we take it you know we strip it down we work on it in increments we build up on those increments as we go along i will be explaining why we do a certain thing why we yep. don't do a certain thing um and just trying to give them that kind of like holistic understanding of um you know of the movements themselves not just this is the right way to do it but this is the right way to do it and this is why this is the right way to do it yeah but um, if that doesn't work for you then hey ho you know let's find a different way to do it because yeah, that's obviously not working <laughs> yeah <Love> that. <laughs> but that, that's the thing i think weightlifting specifically is very similar to like for example how you would learn how to um play a musical instrument and this is kind of one of the things that I learned when I was playing drums. It's, it's a technique called chunking. For example, like you would play a note or you would play a beat and then you would then play another beat and then you would go back, play that first beat and you would play those two together. And then you would play the third beat and then you would play all three of those beats together. Mm -hmm. So that essentially you're taking each chunk bit by bit and you're just building and building and building and building. So you'll see a snatch and then you'll go overhead squat snatch balance turnover hip snatch hang snatch snatch or however you want to do it you know some people like to go to the floor and that's absolutely fine like top down bottom to, bottom to top you know what works for people um you know some coaches prefer that i always prefer top down just because i'm more bothered about the end result mm. but then i notice that in a lot of people actually the first pull is the issue but yeah. for me I'm just like, well, you know, it works really well yeah. in terms of just getting them uh, to, to understand what position they should be in overhead, which is essentially the most dangerous position. If you yeah. don't get this right, then it doesn't matter, you know, if your back is a little bit rounded off the ground. If you can't catch the bar here, it's going to land on your head. And there's a lot more issues involved around this part of the body than there is obviously i might people with back issues might tell me different but i would argue that if you if you have a bar land on your head and it gives you concussion or something even worse then i think that that might be a little bit worse than maybe just yeah you know. it's, it's interesting because like you know again you're, you're kind of working from the top down because you're targeting the most difficult area and the area that people need the most practice in which is you know again arguably the catch um first and foremost which is again, totally valid way of doing it. Like I really like a bottom up version simply because it's like, it's more kind of sequential. Yeah. And it's like, you're never gonna have a good third pull if you haven't got your first pull in order. Yep. But it's like, there's no, you can argue for either way, um, you know, and, and neither is more right than the other. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we could argue to the cows come home. They're both yeah. exactly, it's exactly the same. It, it, it it's, it's, it's the same end result. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. It's like what, you know, who, who the process only matters in relation to the end result. What is the end result? Are they snatching? Are they cleaning? Yeah. Are they cleaning? Are they jerking? Jerking? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think in competition, if we steer away a little bit from like training coaching or like practice coaching rather than competition coaching, yeah. 
I think that's a different side of, of coaching because yeah, yeah. I think the difference between competition coaching and coaching in practice, like, you know, training, when you train, it's fine to change things. But when you are competing, if you are giving someone loads of different cues, first of all, that they've never heard before or that they don't need, you're going to put that, that, that athlete under a lot more stress because all they need to do to go out on that platform is exactly what you've been working on in training and for you to shout maybe a couple of things or even just say to them, like, I want you to pull hard, like finish, finish tall, you know, just something that relates to that lifter that they know what that means to them. If you just go out and shout like big chest, but they have no idea what that means, that's not helpful to anyone. Yeah, competition is like, you know, they've done the work. Yeah. Like the movement's about, it's probably as good as it's going to be up until leading to that competition. It, you know, it's, you can guide them and like, you know, again, but it's got to be something they're familiar with. Yeah. So if it's like, you know, a big pull, or like, you know, strong catch, whatever it is, it's got to be something you've already established. You know, it's a competition warm up, not a training session. So it's yeah. just not yeah, exactly. anything major. You know, it would, we might tweak certain things, but only, you know, stuff that we've sort of seen before. But I think like a lot of it is just, you know, so I think we touched on this last week um, about like the kind of the headspace and the emotions around lifting and I'm um, like dealing with heavy weights and like a lot of competition coaching is literally just like, <laughs> are you happy? Are you good to go out? Yeah, like, yeah that's great. Let's go. Yeah. You know? And just like, yeah, if, if they went out and they missed their first snatch, like how do you encourage them to attack the second one? Yeah. You know, how do you get them out of that? Like, you know, the kind of negative headspace. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I've, it's a lot more like, it's a little bit more uh, like niche. It's a little bit more a case of, it's not necessarily what you need to change. It's just necessarily what is going to make them perform the best on the platform, whether it be saying absolutely jackal, yeah. you know, because I, 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 for one, I don't personally like people talking a lot to me when I'm warming up and when I'm going out on the platform. Yeah, um, but they're always very consistent whenever you're warming up as well. Like, you, you know, you don't, get really shouty and you don't get really upset and you don't get really happy or late. You're just a constant. And yeah. so it's like, that's just really easy to do. It makes my job easier. <laughs> yeah. Whereas some people might need a little bit more hype. You know, well, I've seen coaches like slap their athletes on the trap, slap them on the arse, slap them on the legs, like all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, never, it's never worked for me, but you know, it, for some, someone that might, that's might be what they need because yeah. sometimes when you miss lifts, it just, you know, you're scared. Like it's a scary place to be on a platform by yourself. You're not in the comfort of your coach. You're not yeah. in the comfort of your friends or your club. You know, you're out there with more pressure on a competition floor. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of thoughts that go through, you know, your, you know your head when you're walking out on the platform but the one thing that should always remain is it doesn't matter what you do on the platform you'll always make your coach proud even if you bum out like yeah. they're not going to be annoyed at you they'll, they'll be annoyed at their self it's not your fault it's theirs <laughs> i i would always argue it's obviously if you do something stupid like you go yeah let's jump 20 kilos when you've never done it before but again <laughs> you could argue that's the coach's choice. The coach goes, no, we're not doing that because that's a silly choice. Sit down, shut up and wait two minutes. <laughs> I think like, that's like, there's definitely a kind of responsibility as, you know, a coach for that individual's like success or their failure, like whether that's in competition or whether that's in training. And, um, but again, it so de it does like depend a lot on the individual. Like some people are just like, it, who was it? It was, um, I was on another podcast. I want to say, uh, Teddy's podcast. And <laughs> Max was saying that like, you know, coaches don't really do much. We just, sometimes we make good suggestions, <laughs> you know? but that's it. It's like, yeah. I can't force you to make that lift. I can't yeah. force you to go to training. I can't force you to go to competition. It's like, you know, all we can do is encourage and suggest. Yeah. And, um, and there is a, an element of like that is up to the lifter um, to kind of execute. But then on the other hand, if you're making crap suggestions, that is on you. So yeah, it's yeah. A, bit of, a bit of both, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. That was a good question. I, I enjoyed delving into that. Yeah. 
We've got, just have a look. We've got some from Zarko. Big Z. Uh, we've got, oh, we've got a long, a big, a big discussion and then probably a slightly shorter one. All right. Um, short pull versus long pull. I mean, I know that you're going to say a little bit more about this, but I think for me, it does depend. I would always go longer rather than shorter. But the thing is, some people arguably might not need a long pull. Some people might not be able to achieve a long pull. You know, as much as you're trying to get them to finish with their legs and finish really nice and tall, sometimes it doesn't work because they can't stay balanced. Mm. As, as ideal as that might be in your head, thinking they have to be in this position, why do they have to be in that position? If, then, if they can't get in that position, it's either a case of you trying to strip it down to get them in that position or they physically can't get in that position because they finish with their legs and you know their legs are really strong and they upper body like noodles mm. so they just finish with their legs um mm. so i'd say it depends that's my answer i'm not going to go any deeper into that all i'm going to say is it would depend but i'm more an advocate of a longer pull over a shorter pull yeah i've been doing some because this is something that like I was looking at in my lifting um, is basically like, you know, what can I tweak? And uh, the pull was something that I wanted to experiment a little bit with. So I've been like, again, playing with like the timing and like, how long to pull for and how hard to pull that sort of thing. Um, in conclusion, it depends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I think, um, yeah, that, that's basically what I found. Um, <laughs> I, that's Great a, study. Uh, yeah, great study. Right, next question. Uh, so, Marco, uh, he's got another question. No. Um, <laughs> so, I think the European, right, the, again, big generalizations, but like generally from like kind of European lifters, Russian lifters, that kind of thing, you'll see a lot more sort of hip extension that arms aren't quite as active as, say, Chinese lifters, where they teach, I believe, for the clean, it's up to the navel, and then for the snatch, it's like up to the sternum. Yeah really high like but i wonder if it comes down to just physiology and just what differences yeah agree um i think if you have a really strong like upper body um obviously you're going to be able to pull a hell of a lot harder you're going to probably get a little bit more um you know a little bit more reward from that i think like as well if you're the kind of lifter again like this is just what i assume um yep. i should probably do some studies into this but let's have a look um if you've got like a really really long torso and really short legs you could probably benefit from pulling a little bit more because it's more important yeah. if you height on the bar than if you've got really really long legs and a really short torso in which case you can just like sneak under but um you know in which case in the former case more of a pull is probably you know more useful whereas in the left in the latter case it's probably not quite as necessary um, or at least to the same degree. Um, you know, a, a, again, the kind of strength of your upper body, you might find that like guys generally have stronger upper bodies relative to their lower bodies. So they might be able to pull harder and for longer. Whereas for women, they've got stronger legs compared to their upper body. Yeah. So it might be less so. Um, again, I think just try both, see what works for you. I don't think it's like, we've got these two extremes. We've got like really, really long pull, um, really like almost no pull and I don't think that one or the other is necessarily the best I think yeah. there's some middle ground there um, and obviously to a degree that's going to depend on the lifter um, I've found like it's a little bit longer has helped my lifting yeah um, so I think it's definitely something that people should try out um, I think like I can only speak for British weightlifting but like a, a lot of people just think that the arms don't do anything you know, the arms are like chains, chains, the arms are like ropes. And it's like, well, yes, but actually no. Um, you know, you want to get every little advantage that you can Absolutely. out of the movement, you know. And if, you know, pulling on the damn thing is going to give it an extra inch or two of height, yep. do it. For me, um, I think the pull with the arms starts when you come past the knees where you're pulling the arms in and then up. Yeah. It's, rather it's, than just you extend yeah. and then you pull because it's yeah. too late then yeah. all your arms are doing is just floppy. Like you said, all you're going to do is just, you're going to slam the bar up and then you've got no tension in the bar. But what you are doing is obviously you're pulling under 
from yeah. here. And then, you know, the only tension you've got is when you go wham like that. Yeah. But if you can go, it's a lot stiffer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thinking definitely. more about that. If you look like, at Lasher, Lasher is a perfect example of that because he has tension in his upper body the whole time, even through his first pull. Yeah. If you've watched it, it's correct. And his arms don't bend early, but he's got so much tension in his upper back and in his shoulders. But you'll also notice that he's rounded. But I don't understand how he does it. It's, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> it, it shows in his snatches and in his cleans, you know. <laughs> he's the best snatcher. Well, arguably, I guess not pound for pound, but in terms of weight on the bar. And he's the best clean and jerker. Yeah. Not pound for pound, obviously. Don't quote me, but <laughs> I'm talking weight on the bar. I'm not talking pound for pound because yeah. let's be honest, he's 170 kilos. Yeah, <laughs> but he's a big boy. He, but yeah, boy. and I'm not saying um, do like I do because I definitely don't pull long. I'm a very short puller. But the thing is, I think it works for me. Um, yeah, I mean, some people yeah. might argue that I could do be benefit for more pull. And I would agree with you. I could definitely benefit from more pull. But guess what? I finish with my legs. I still managed to get under it. So I'm pretty happy with that. For my lifters, that's a different story. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Exactly. <laughs> but like, no, but I think this is it. It's like, you know, I can, I could tell you to, you know, pull, pull more, pull harder, like, and give you loads of exercises for that. But I think, people after a, you know enough time in this sport they figure out what works best for them yeah and, you know like you can do all the drills in the world and for whatever reason it's still better if you just like sneak under that bar that's just what's going to get you the most way you know that's what works yeah. for you so it's like that's one of those kind of individual you know differences again you're probably maybe towards you know the kind of like less pull side of it whereas some people might be towards the other other end it kind of depends really yeah. But it's, also, it's like there's that trade-off between putting height on the bar and getting under it in time yeah because how much height do you want to put on the bar because like yes the emphasis to extend and pull is to get get to have the time to get under the bar but if you're giving yourself too much time will you lose it behind you yeah but also you lose it forward or you know whatever you've also got to think about the longer you pull the longer you have to stay on your toes which is not balanced no yeah but yeah it's difficult to to kind of maintain but yeah no i think it's like yes yeah, it's, it's like at what point like I, I could carry on pulling on a bar for as long as i can and then like suddenly i've, I've yes. run out of time to drop under it. yeah or you know there's a <laughs> Been pulling up and pulling up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do the fucking friggin' longest pull in the world, but if you can't yeah. get under it, it's not a snack, yeah. is it? No, no. Like, who cares? Like, well done. You know? Be like this. Oh, I was so close. No, you weren't, mate. That that was a pull. That was a, <laughs> that was, that was a high pull, not a snatch. Pull. A snatch. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it's yeah, it's kind of like bearing that in mind that it's like okay, yeah, you know. Pulling it is important, arguably, but what's more important is actually getting under the bloody thing. So yeah, with yeah. emphasis on extending. Yeah. So yeah, it depends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's just go back to the first answer and say it depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we left it at that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Cool. Have we got time for one more? I reckon so. We've got time for one more. Go on, a quick one. Know. If, if, the, if they want to go, you know what? You can go. Nobody's stopping you. It's a free country. Um, we've got another That's one. You Mark. think? <laughs> oh, yeah. This is why lockdown's happening, Alex. <laughs> Have you ever seen V for Vendetta? I haven't. This I haven't. is the start. This is the start of V for Vendetta. Yeah, man. Anyway, well, carry on. At least I've got my garden gym, so. <laughs> yeah another one from zarko what are some good accessory exercises for weightlifting generally and how do they carry over i mean that's not a small question but fair enough <laughs> well um, i would say i usually categorize it into two categories stability and uh armor building i would call it so yeah. basically like preventing any kind of niggles that you have from overworking the triceps through the pushing movements mm. uh, or even overworking the, uh, the elbow through the pull because obviously you're in a flexed wrist position. So you're really going to work on 
uh, the flexors rather than the extensors. Uh, obviously, shoulders, your knees take a batter in, your, your lower back, your ankles. So I think for me, it's more just to take in a well-rounded approach to make sure that everything is balanced yeah. rather than you well, need to get I, um, the body. Can I interrupt you for a second? Because you, you mentioned about balance. And I think you know, this is something that like drives me mad because everybody's they're just solely focused on you know just weightlifting and you know getting good at the snatch and clean and jerk. And it's like I think in order to be a good weightlifter, you have to be a balanced athlete. You've got to be, you know, obviously the aim of the game is to be strong, right? But how do you achieve that? Is it just snatching and clean and jerking every day? Well, you know, there's got to be, you know, if your lower body's lacking, work on that. If your upper body's needs work, work on that, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, just take stock of where you are and just, you know, work on being balanced, well round. Yeah, precisely. But yes. Absolutely. Because just because weightlifting, you know, is basically all legs. Yeah. You know, it is obviously upper body, but it's basically all legs. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean that the only thing you should work on is your quads, your hamstrings, your glutes, you mm. know, or your calves. You still need to work on your upper back. You still need to work on your shoulders, your elbows, your triceps, you know, your forearms, your grip, even your chest, tighten your chest. If you keep losing it behind, maybe you need to stiffen up this pec a little bit. Mm. So what do you do? You could do single arm presses. You could do single arm uh, dumbbell presses, whatever it might be, just to sort of stiffen up and keep that shoulder nice and compact and tight. So mm. like I said, I think it's striking a balance, but also having a, like some kind of stability aspect in there mm. um you know whether it be like single leg work for example is stability you know you're still getting accessory movements and honestly a lot of people will say this and i know that um i give split squats to absolutely everybody but <laughs> genuinely split squats are the best variation of a squat outside of a squat that i could ever think yeah. of no i would completely like agree any with any variation of a split squat maybe not like I do like walking lunges, but I don't know. I feel like it's I more just a case pain. of like, it's, I don't know. It's just, a, I, they're just pain to set up. That's what I hate. Yeah, you but know, also they're just them. like really painful. And also you can't really use a lot of weight no. and you know, it takes a lot of space and mm -hmm. you know, it hurts your glutes. And I don't really want that. I'd rather just put more weight on the bar and do more reps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, what accessory exercise? We don't care. Just put more weight on the bar. Yeah. The thing <laughs> is as well is uh, like obviously because pulls and presses and squats are also considered accessories. You know, they're strength accessory. It's not as a weightlifter, our main movements are snatch and clean jerk. If you're an athlete who does a different sport, then obviously everything is an accessory because your sport is not the gym. Your sport is football, badminton, squash, whatever it might be. You know, but as a weightlifter, even squats and stuff are accessories. So I think even those as well, you know, and this is going to sound super controversial, but like people are really bothered about how much their squat is. But if you can only snatch 50 kilos, but your squat is 300, no one cares. Yes, exactly. Literally no one cares. It's impressive to you. You know, yeah. I'm not going to take that away from you. You squat 300 kilos. That's bloody amazing. But mm. in weightlifting, you can only snatch 50 kilos. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that 50 kilos is crap, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you're flouting, I can squat 300 kilos, but I can only snatch 50. Well, maybe you should squat less and work on your snatch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause this is it. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, what is the end goal? Snatch and clean and jerk and total. Right. <laughs> So you know, like everything else is just fluff. Everything else is a means to an end. I don't care how much you bench. I don't care how much you squat. I don't care how much you pull. Whatever. Yeah. It's like how much you snatch, how much do you clean and jerk? Yeah. Like, so I think accessory exercises, like, yeah, they, they are important, but they are a means to an end yes. and not the end goal. So Precisely. That's exactly what I was getting at. But yeah, do you just, work you made first. my point sound less <laughs> controversial. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and say squats don't matter. <laughs> I'm just don't give a shit about your squat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. They do. I'll start sending you squat videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, all you send me is. To be fair, that's probably my. That's the only exercise I enjoy in weightlifting. I don't enjoy anything else. You're not. No. <laughs> is this why you're doing CrossFit? 
<laughs> no, it's not why I'm doing CrossFit. I'm doing CrossFit because I'm lazy to do normal exercise. So I'd rather just do a 15 minute AMRAP and see how many reps I can do. That's disgusting. And then I don't have to count. I can just do like. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and then they're like, "Yeah, but how how do you measure your progress?" And I'm like, "Can you see this puddle of sweat on my on the ground? <laughs> yeah. That's my <laughs> progress, sir." Bringing out your <laughs> pyrex into a little pyrex, you measuring <laughs> yeah. sweat you got yeah. this session. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, cool. no, um, yeah, accessory. I think like, should we discuss which accessory exercises we like? Just as a quick finisher. Single leg, single arm work, lots of core work, lots of upper back work. I've started incorporating grip work. Mm. And this is another subject as well we can, we can get onto next week. But people will argue we hook grip, so we shouldn't work on grip. I disagree. Yes. I, I completely I disagree, disagree with that because <laughs> although we are hook gripping, you're mm. still gripping the bar, but you know you're if you're hook gripping you squeeze your your wrist and and all you're getting is a lot of work through your flexors yeah. which is a lot a lot of the reason why weightlifters tend to get elbow pain and also potentially shoulder pain because they're gripping the bar through just their thumb and their index finger and their middle finger but they're not actually working you know the 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 uh the other side like the extensors and there's 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 a lot of studies that have been shown to sh shown to suggest that grip is like is like a good predictor of how strong you are yeah um and i think it's definitely a missing link in a lot of people where if you've ever felt like you know you're lifting a, a bar off the ground and you think fuck me this is heavy <laughs> you know uh. You know, it, it's it's not just because you're, you know, inherently maybe like a little weak in the upper back or weak in the legs, or whatever it might be. It might also be because your grip is weak where you feel like you haven't got a good hold of the bar. No, definitely. Because there's, um, I think there's been a couple of studies that have essentially shown, you know, what you're saying is that like, once your grip starts to go and your body realizes that whatever you're hanging on to is about to, you're about to let go of it it reduces your force output yeah. um, to quite a measurable degree. And you, you know, you probably felt it when you're deadlifting. It's like, you know, the moment that bar starts to unroll, you're suddenly not moving anymore because it's like, you know, it's, it's almost as if there's just a switch that's flipped. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's like, obviously the more grip strength you have, the more confident you're going to be with the given weights. You're not going to have, you know, that issue and you're going to be able to, you know, output as much force as you can. Also, like, you know, if hook grip was the be all end all, then we wouldn't yep. need the straps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's, there's definitely advantages to be had from, from grip work. Definitely. Um, I think, yeah, it's just like, it's balancing everything as well. It's like, you know, if you spend half an hour doing grip work, um, you know, every session, it's like, well, <laughs> what's the most bang for your you're back? gonna have absolutely you're gonna have popeye forearms you're, you're gonna, gonna have popeye, you're forearms, gonna but... popeye snatcher but <laughs> you know it's probably not very like <laughs> you're never gonna lose that bar but uh, you might not you're snatching off the off the plates rather than off the bar because you <laughs> yeah, you're just is that no it's definitely not legal <laughs> um no i don't think that's legal there's one way to find out though I'm not trying that. I don't even <laughs> think I could do that with 40 kilos, mate. <laughs> it would, yeah, that, that's an accident waiting to happen. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. Hopefully we aren't um, covered. We covered quite a few questions there, which is good. Yeah, we had six questions in total. So. Yeah. Solid. Mm. Right. Should we wrap it there then? I think that sounds good. Sweet. Guys, thanks for coming again. Um, 